Hey YouTube, welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Daniel Kaplan. And in today's video, we're gonna talk all about sedative, hypnotic, and anxiolytic drugs. We're gonna start by explaining the history behind things like barbiturates, and then we'll move on to benzodiazepine. And then after we finish that, we're gonna go through the criterion to meet a sedative, hypnotic, or anxiolytic use disorder. And in the DSM-5, you'll notice that the language is a substance use disorder. So if it's um, sedative, hypnotic, or anxiolytic, it will be a sedative, hypnotic, anxiolytic use disorder. We'll also talk about the criteria that needs to be met. We'll talk about um, specifiers such as current use versus in remission. And then I'll talk to you about the general prevalence of the disorder. So if you like what you have to see, if you learn something new, hit the like button, subscribe, click the notifications tabs, uh, and that will help me bring this video to a larger audience. Uh, but without further ado, let's talk about sedative hypnotic and anxiolytic drugs. So in the previous video, we talked about alcohol. And alcohol is one of the classes of a depressant and a depressant is any kind of medication or drug that slows down the central nervous system or suppresses activity in the central nervous system. Now, alcohol and sedative hypnotic drugs operate very similarly because they react to the same neurotransmitter. So if we think about the neurotransmitter or the chemical in the brain, linked to alcohol, it's GABA. The same thing could be said about sedative hypnotic drugs, but let's kind of talk about what happens when a person takes one of these medications. So a sedative hypnotic drug typically is gonna produce some level of either relaxation, elimination of anxiety or drowsiness. So at low doses, it's going to have a calming effect or a sedative effect. So there's the relaxation component. But at higher doses, they can be more sleep inducing or what we refer to as hypnotic. And the two general subtypes of sedative hypnotic drugs are barbiturates and benzodiazepines. Now, when we talk about barbiturates, Barbiturates ha have been around for a long time. In fact, they're uh, the earliest treatment we've used to help people fight anxiety or to deal with sleep. The problem is that if you abuse them or if you mix barbiturates with, let's say, alcohol, you run the risk of overdose, right? So um, if you think about many celebrities, uh, in the 1960s and 70s, and some of the overdose you, you hear about, it was mixing alcohol and barbiturates, right? So they certainly can help you, but they also can create a sense of uh, substance abuse dependence, uh, and as I said, overdose. Now, I said to you this already, and as part of my introductory remarks that GABA is at play for both alcohol and barbiturates. And because of that, the synergistic effect or the mixing of the two uh, can create a really dangerous compound. Now, barbiturates are typically taken in the pill form, um, but we realize that barbiturates can be quite dangerous. Um, so we've discovered uh, safer alternatives such as benzodiazepines and both uh, alcohol, barbiturates and benzodiazepines, they're all metabolized in the liver. So why are barbiturates so dangerous? Because as you're using it, you're building up a tolerance, right? And you're building up a dependency. And with all drugs, we have what's called an effective dose and a lethal dose. An effective dose is the amount of the drug needed 
to achieve whatever goal. So if it's to eliminate anxiety, um, great, this drug's gonna eliminate anxiety. The lethal dose is the dose by which people are going to start dying. And we talk about effective dose for 50%, lethal dose for 50%, effective dose for 95%, lethal dose for 95%. So these are the typical ways we measure it. The problem is that the therapeutic index, the difference between the effective dose and the lethal dose is much smaller than other drugs. So as you're developing a tolerance, you're moving closer and closer to the lethal dose, which creates a greater risk of um, you know, overdose and death. So fortunately for us, we started to discover safer alternatives to uh, barbiturates, and they came in the form of benzodiazepine. So benzodiazepine, these are uh, usually anxiety relieving, and they can help with sleep and, and whatnot. Um, things like Ativan or Valium or Xanax, and they operate very similar to barbiturates with a, a few uh, exceptions. One, there is a larger therapeutic index. There's a, it's far safer. You would have to take a lot more of these benzodiazepines to have an overdose or hit the lethal dose threshold. Uh, two, in terms of how they operate, benzodiazepines give you that anxiety relief without the drowsiness, which is really cool because when we talked about barbiturates, high doses really make you drowsy and sleepy and whatnot. But that doesn't mean you can't overdose on benzodiazepines as well, uh, right? So if you take sufficient dose, it is still going to uh, kill you, uh, but it's uh, because the therapeutic index is, is wider, it's considered a safer alternative. Now, let's talk about the criterion in order to get a sedative hypnotic or anxiolytic use disorder. As with all substances of abuse, you were tracking it for 12 months and there has to be some level of clinical impairment with two or more of the following features plus tolerance and withdrawal, we'll get into it. But so when I go through these symptoms in criterion A, you only need two. Uh, the more you have, the more severe the condition. Uh, we'll get into that as well. So. What are some of the criterion of a set of hypnotic and anxiolytic use disorder? Well, needing to take more and more over a period of time. So that coupled with being unsuccessful in cutting down or trying to um, address it, right? That plus trying to, or spending a lot of time either securing the drug, using the drug, or recovering from its effects. And then there's cravings, right? So craving to use the drug. This point here about cravings is common uh, in all of the conditions as well. And I wanna make it a point that even if you're in recovery, you might still have cravings. So afterwards, this craving, when you're done using the drug is no longer considered one of the criteria. Also failure to fulfill major obligations at work or home or at school, interpersonal problems caused by it, um, loss of uh, social activities, occupational activities, hazardous use such as, uh, you know, working, I don't know, you're working at Home Depot or something and you're using one of the forklifts. Can't do that uh, under set of hypnotic or anxiolytic use, but you're doing it anyway, disregarding that. And uh, persistent use despite the damage it's caused. So that's criterion A. You only need two of those criteria, but the more you have, 
the greater the severity of the condition. In criterion B, we're looking at tolerance. So here there's either increased usage of the drug to get a previous high, or if you stay at the same amount of the drug, you're not getting as much of a high, right? So that's what we describe tolerance as. And then withdrawal, we talk about um, either experiencing the withdrawal or taking sedative hypnotics or anxiolytics to avoid or alleviate the withdrawal symptoms. Now, uh, one thing that needs to be noted is that these pills can be prescribed appropriately as well by a medical professional or under medical supervision. So if you're taking these medications as prescribed under medical supervision, you will not meet criterion B or C, right? This is only when you're doing it recreationally. All right, so let's talk about severity, right? I mentioned you only need two symptoms. So if you have two to three of the symptoms in criterion A, we're gonna call this a mild substance use disorder. If you have four to five, we're gonna call this moderate. And if you have six or more, we're gonna call this a severe condition. So that's if you're currently using barbiturates, benzodiazepine or whatnot. What if you stopped? Well, we have criteria as well that specifies when it's in remission. So if you have stopped for three plus months, but less than a year, we call that in early remission. If it's um, 12 months or longer or one, one year plus, we would call this sustained remission. Now, as I mentioned, in order to be in remission, you have to have none of the criteria uh, that you previously had with the exception of cravings. We, we acknowledge that cravings are gonna to continue to occur. So we talked about remission in, in an early sense, sustained remission, and then there is the concept of a controlled environment. This is when a person's not using, but it's because they're in an environment that they don't have access to the drug. So if a person is in rehab, right? So they're not going to have access to the drug hopefully, and uh, we would say uh, sedative hypnotic or anxiolytic use disorder in remission in a controlled environment. So that tells everybody in the treatment team why it is that this person is no longer using, right? So we have to specify that. Now, what is the prevalence? Uh, we thought that uh, benzodiazepine was safe. We thought it was a safe alternative um, to other uh, set of hypnotics, but it's not. What we've come to learn is that roughly 1% of adults develop some form of dependency on benzodiazepine at one point or another in their life. And that's huge. So that's one out of 100 people are going to develop some form of an addiction to the pain, med uh, pardon me, to the anxiety medication. So we have to be very careful, even in prescribing this. And this is why many practitioners will try other forms of medication before they will put someone on a benzodiazepine. It's still available. We still use it. But we're going to try things like uh, an SSRI, a form of an antidepressant, before we're going to put you on a benzodiazepine. When it comes to sleep conditions, you're more likely to, to still be put on a benzodiazepine or even a barbiturate. So they're still around in society, but we try, try, try not to put people in the position to have to uh, develop an addiction. So this is all you need to know about barbiturates, benzodiazepines sedative, hypnotic, and anxiolytic use disorders, how we diagnose some of the specifiers, and uh, a cautionary tale of there still being about 1% of people who acquire this disorder. So please, as I said, uh, if you found this video useful, if you learned something new, hit the like button, subscribe, click the notifications tab, 
And I always conclude my video by asking you to, if you have a question or you have a thought related to the video, please put it in the comment section below. I read every comment. I respond to every comment. And this, I want to be sort of like a learning community. So I hope you will help me bring this video to a larger audience. Until next time, people, take care.